So Victor, we're actually live, uh, but we'll wait for two minutes to start. It's interesting, you know, how often for both you and I and our teams, the amount of queries we start getting when an incident happens. And would it be great to actually do all that planning and thinking when there is stability or at least <laughs> moments of yeah. calm? <clears throat> I agree. Yeah, I love, I would love the ability for businesses to be more deliberate as they think about risk management, whether that's sourcing, procurement. You no, know, they, they, they careen from crisis to crisis and then are self-congratulatory when they, when they, you know, somehow muddle through. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Should be another one of my cognitive dissonance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I just, you know, I'm still always like, I reflect on that survey that we did during COVID. I'm always reflect on that. I'm like, how is that possible in the middle of that? And, and you know, you would think that didn't raise the bar. I know, just an excellent example. It just shows how unimaginative people are. Yeah. But I think, you know, so you would hope that at least our discipline uh, is changing. We're definitely seeing, you know, many leaders rise to that challenge, but hopefully more. When the clock strikes 1.30 EST, we will formally begin. Hi, everyone. Today's session is focused on how do you navigate business operations in times of conflict with a very specific focus on how sourcing, procurement, risk, and supply chain leaders should be thinking about acting on how they ensure stable business operations or responsive business operations during times of conflict. The reality of what Victor and I are going to be talking about today, we could change the case study instead of the impact that we're seeing today from the Israel-Gaza region. We could replace that with Russia-Ukraine. We could even talk about COVID as such. So think of this is this is not a political discussion. This is very much a risk management risk avoidance, risk mitigation discussion, specifically focused around hey, how should you think about business operations in times of conflict? As I reflected on this topic, one of the things that stood out to me was that, you know, this is a company that I founded in 2017. And so we had numerous bank insurance companies, high tech companies leveraging us for real time intelligence. But within the throes of COVID, when we did a survey to the wider market on which risk types mattered to you. And this was in 2021. So most companies had undergone at least a year of challenges because of COVID. And we asked which risk type was important to you. Only 9% said that they were monitoring locations or geopolitical issues as a risk management uh, discipline. And I think this is what brings us to today's discussion to really raise the awareness of how one should think about location-based, geographic-based risk. We're gonna use Israel-Gaza as a case study, but the reality is it could have been any conflict in any part of the world, potentially maybe in the future, something in Asia that causes a big conflict. As you go to the next slide, I'm very delighted to let me first introduce uh, my, my other speaker, Victor Meyer, Victor comes to us from a long service, both in the military and more importantly, as you think about risk management, uh, 16 years at Deutsche Bank. And before he joined Supply Wisdom almost four years ago, he was the head of non-financial risk at Deutsche Bank. So really saw this global high, high speed, high kind of classification and experience at that organization. In that whole experience, Victor also 
served on the World Economic Forum as the vice chair of the Pandemic Council. And again, this was pre-COVID. So he comes with a very rich experience of being the risk leader and now as the chief strategy officer at Supply Wisdom advising other clients. Uh, Victor, welcome. Thank you, Atul. A quick background on myself. I'm the founder and chairman of Supply Wisdom. I come with a long background in sourcing, a globalization, and really the intersection of technology, supply chain risk, and, and sourcing. And I've had experience, of course, as a founder of two companies, but also uh, serving on the board uh, of the Defense Department of the United States, Defense Business Board, and now the Reserve Forces Policy Board. So it's really seeing kind of global views on risk and supply chain risk. Next slide, please. So today's focus really starts with this globalization concept, but more importantly, what does risk in an area, a specific region, how that can have an impact on risk management and really how should you think about it? So when you think about this conflict as such, one might think of this as a small specific area where there is a conflict. The reality of life, as Victor will talk about, is how conflicts like this have multiple cascading impacts for all the way from human lives and to business. Today's focus, of course, for us is on specifically risk management. Let me turn it over to Victor to kind of talk you through what the situation is today, and then we'll talk specifically about what are some of the things you should think about and potentially act on. Victor? Thank you, Atul. <clears throat> um, so UK, uh, uh, former UK Prime Minister Harold Macmillan was asked, um, he was once asked what the most troubling aspect or most troubling problem of, of his term in office was. And he responded, events, dear boy, events. So as global companies become even more and more like nation states, um, Ian Bremmer referred to this in a, in a recent TED talk where he said that the, the, um, the global is, is uh, that the global political economy is not going to become a, a competition between China and um, Russia and the United States. It's going to be dominated by by global uh, companies, and yet boards and CEOs still continue to treat geopolitical risk as what I call as the equivalent of what I call flyover states. So they fly over this risk type and they look down, they go, God, it really sucks down there, but I, I got my champagne, I'm in, for, I'm, in, I'm in business class. Meanwhile, their company is down there um, on a day-to-day -day basis operationally, you know, fighting it out. <clears throat> so before we sort of um, go into how to operationalize um, geopolitical risk, we need to talk a, a little bit about the dysfunction of how we're managing it now, because we've got to realize where we are before we realize where, we, where we're going to get to. Um, so I've divided this down in, in, into five um, elements, which I call the, the cognitive dissonance of geopolitical risk. The first one is we continue to say, boards and CEOs in particular continue to say that the world is a more uncertain place, but then we make business decisions as if it's not. I, I um, saw a recent interview on CNBC um, with the head of, uh, of BlackRock's, the vice chairman of, of BlackRock, um, uh, Swiss banker, Philip Hildebrand. Um, and Phil, Philip Hildebrand said, he, he just went down the, um, the, the inventory of financial risks. He says, um, look, equities have been reasonably stable here. So uh, that's that check that goes. The debt markets, the, that, the, the recent sell-off in long-term treasuries, that's not attributable to geopolitical risk, but that one's done. Look at gold prices, reasonably stable. Um, any appreciation due to inflation? Boom, check that one off. Commodities, you know, commodities demand reasonably stable. Look at the oil price; that one's okay. Um, so he went down the sort of the, the the whole taxonomy of financial risks. Then basically, his conclusion was, guys, this is uh, there's nothing to see here. Um, this is this is not really really important um, in terms of the the Israel um, uh, uh, Hamas conflict. The second is we represent disruptive events and the consequences is beyond, is, is beyond our control. Um, a, a couple of weeks back, I had uh, lunch with uh, Lord Gavin Barwell. He was the chief of staff. He's a member of parliament member and chief of staff uh, to um, Theresa May. And he said, 
You know, Victor, I, I can't quite understand how boards can't be paying more attention to this. He said, I sat down with a number of business leaders when I when I was uh, um, in the cabinet uh, working for Theresa May. And, and at that point in time, both Brexit and pandemic were number one and two on the global, on the UK risk register. But when we asked uh, uh, um, CEOs uh, of UK companies about those, they said, yeah, but there's, there's nothing we can do about it. Um, so we're, we're just going to take a wait and see attitude. The third one is, and I, this is one of the most interesting ones, we, we treat the management of geopolitical risk on an ad hoc basis rather than as a proper discipline. Um, I was speaking with um, a, a managing director of a, of a household name um, technology company. Everybody um, on, on this call would be using uh, this, particular, uh, this particular technology. And I said, you know, how are you guys managing geopolitical risk? He goes, ah, my, our CEO knows a guy. I said, interesting, tell me more. He said, he lives on a farm um, in, on the big island of Hawaii. And he's about 90 years old. And he was a former diplomat, former business leader. And they meet every single month. I said, wow, this must be a very smart individual. He goes, yeah, he's apparently one of the smartest guys on geopolitical risk around. I said, well, what do you do with the information? He goes, that's a good question. So <laughs> I'll get to that um, in just a second as we start to look at, at, at um, the model. Um, the fourth one is we, we have the appetite to apply automation to other risk types, but not geopolitical risk. So as you look at post-financial crisis, and in particular in financial services firms, we're managing financial risk on a, um, a, on a daily basis. In market risk, if you were saying, hey, I'm, my market risk management is okay, um, I, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna use, um, I'm gonna mark to market, but I'm gonna use month old marks. People would look at you like you're crazy. And the more volatility is introduced into capital markets as you're seeing um, in, in the recent past, I would say the last five, probably five or six years increased VIX, increased volatility. It becomes even more important to use automation and to use technology tools to monitor where risk is and where it's trending. But we've rejected that for non for for uh, for uh, non financial risk. And then lastly, and this is perhaps the most pernicious one, uh, it's a bias towards optimism. Um, and um, we we tend to rationalize uh, negative outcomes. So sort of back to the uh, uh, disruptive events are beyond our control. There's nothing I can do about it. So I'm going to have a two-step plan, a two-step plan for managing geopolitical risk. Show up and see what happens. So next slide, please. Victor, before you jump on the next slide, just a couple of observations. You know, I often think about number one is we're seeing the disruptions have been rising in both frequency and severity, but the risk models are not reflecting that because they're classifying them either as a beyond their control or, oh, it's it's a once in a while. So, it, you know, we've already, it already happened, let's move on. Not recognizing that fundamentally the risk models are flawed. The second is you're right, which is actually not even capturing at the onset. Like a question to the audience today, for those of you who are involved in supplier onboarding, supplier risk management, how many of you actually capture and know the location of services of your service provider, whether it's an IT services, BPO, tech, data processing, do you actually know what location of service they are using to provide services to you? Again, you know, Victor, back to you. Uh, thanks, Atul. Can we go to the next slide, please? So as you can see by most of the press on this, the concentration is on uh, is on traded assets. It's it's on financial. It's on the capital markets, whether that be oil or if you're a sales and trading guy in a bank, you're focused on can I get these ATFs out the door? Um, you know, if they do talk about geopolitical risks, it's like oh, you know we can't do anything about it, and they very very rarely talk about the, the you know they rarely the CEOs rarely get out of the aircraft and go down to uh, uh, into the flyover states and see what their teams are dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. There was a gentleman that was, uh, uh, his name's Reginald Victor Jones. He's known as the, as the, um, as the father of, of modern scientific intelligence. In fact, he was probably single-handedly responsible for 
um, Britain's victory during the Battle of Britain because they, they, um, the, uh, the British used an intelligence-led strategy that helped them avoid um, the, uh, the Nazi um, blitzkrieg or the Nazi blitz uh, bombings. Um, and he said a, a very interesting thing that's always influenced my thinking vis-a-vis uh, -vis this type of, uh, of risk management. That is, um, I need to know what I need to know until I can believe what I want to believe. So if we can go to the next slide. <clears throat> there are two sort of types of, uh, of, of or two categories of, uh, of, of um, knowing what you need to know or knowledge that's necessary to manage uh, geopolitical risk. Um, the first is, is sort of indications and warnings. This is rapid onset. And I'll talk about um, the, the, the attributes of catastrophic risk in a few moments. But when you talk about indications and warnings, these are these are rapid onset events are very difficult to predict. But indications, you know, rapid onset events are very, very few and far between it. And indeed, rap these rapid onset or indication or warnings events are typically um, there are um, there are indicators um, in terms of the second type uh, of information, trends and patterns that are predictive in nature and can be used to influence thinking, particularly with, in, with combined by, uh, with it, when combined with um, good innovative risk, risk management techniques for managing high impact, uh, low probability events like scenario analysis. But when these things are combined together, looking at second order effects for indications and warnings, but looking in advance of trends and patterns in a particular risk profile for a country or a city or a region, then you can start to know what you need to know before you can believe what you want to believe. The alternative is the two-step plan or what firms really, really like to do, which is rally to the cause, successfully manage a crisis, uh, realize some damage, but then congratulate themselves on being able to, do, to uh, perform good crisis management. It is a, um, it's, it is axiomatic in, uh, in management of uh, geopolitical risks that the mechanisms that are put in place before crisis begins will determine the success with which an organization is able to manage those crises in a disruptive uh, environment. Next slide, please. So when you look at what uh, that what the uh, what the, the 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 information feed looks like when we're in order to be able to look at those trending, each and every event that happens in a region, uh, a city, or, or a country, is an it represents an incremental change to the risk profile. Now those changes can be positive, risk does improve, or negative. And when you get a series of them, it can, ex it can indicate an accelerating trend. So the first derivative of the trend is, it can indicate a, a, an accelerating trend. And these are the ones that really need to be, to, to, to be focused on. Yeah. So now you understand a bit, of the, a bit about what A, what's wrong, and B, about the philosophy in terms of the information required to be able to manage risk. Now we're missing a, a framework. So Atul, can you, you can talk a little bit about a framework and how to and how to apply it? Yeah, absolutely. So you know what Victor just kind of shared with you is the challenge that we see in the marketplace, right? Which is that here's a risk that is often flaring up, and many times it's a known risk. You know, what if you think about China, Taiwan, and the potential impact of that? We know what that is. We're aware of it. If it were to potentially happen in the future, between now and then, what do we, did we do to prepare for it? And so let's let's focus on putting yourself in the shoes of the risk manager and what should risk manager be doing? And in this case, our ask is no longer do this once a year, which has been the risk assessment practice for critical third parties, assess them once a year, assess them on onboarding, and then for the ones that are less critical every two or three years. How about we don't do that? Or if we are doing that, we add this discipline. So here's six questions that risk managers should ask the, themselves frequently. Whether you believe in ratings or not is immaterial. The, question, the bigger question is, are risks increasing or decreasing? How do you know that? Do you have a mechanism where you're clearly understanding 
which risk is increasing or decreasing? And most importantly, what are the most significant risks that you are seeing? So you know what's increasing, what's decreasing, but you should also be asking yourself and knowing what are the most significant ones? And then are those risks within your risk appetite? Now, for some of you that are in banking, financial services, insurance, you really get that. Your risk appetite, risk tolerance, often you're very clear on what that is for what risk type. So the question there would be is, do you know what that risk appetite is for geographic, for location risk? Do you have tools and mechanisms in place, right? Do you have applications in place that you can monitor these risks effectively? Many of these risks don't just occur and are over. Many of these risks cascade, multiply, maybe even accelerate maybe increase in, in, in scale and impact, while other times they might peter away. But do you actually have tools in place? Because the assessments don't work in this case, right? You are not gonna understand what is my fundamental risk right now, one day later, a week later, a few days later, right? You're not gonna know that unless you have the right tools in place to understand it on an ongoing basis. That's very much about questions about understanding. Then the next thing is, Sorry, uh, two more points on the last one. What remediation plans do you have in place to reduce that risk to the ones that are outside your risk appetite? What actions can you take? Well, we'll talk about kind of how you can prepare for the future, but have you actually gone through that, thought through that? So, you know, if you see a certain risk, what remediation plans you place that you put into place? And then the final being is, what emerging risk could cause disruptions in the future, right? So if you have a preponderance of operations in Mexico, what would an instability, whether it's economic, whether it's political, or whether there is you know, chaos in a certain area, what impact would that have? Ask yourself the same question if you have a preponderance of your supply chain that's in Asia, particularly around China, Taiwan. What impact would that have? So again, these are six questions that Victor and I think risk managers should be asking themselves more frequently. And if the answer to that is, I don't know, then let's, let's engage in a dialogue on how you can specifically make progress on that. Next slide, please. So I think we're gonna spend, hopefully we've, we have <laughs> really you know, beat the drum very clearly on why this risk type matters, right? Location, geographic, geopolitical, why does this matter? We're gonna go deeper into that model, but how do you make this actionable? Well, to apply this, to make risk mitigation, risk management around this risk type is you have to understand what is the probability of that risk? And really, I really have to remind everybody is, our risk models are outdated. Look at the frequency of disruptions that are occurring. So be, be very objective about the probability of that risk. What is the exposure of your firm? Like, you know, if you're a bank whose operations are primarily in the U.S. compared to, you know, an oil company that's globally distributed, your risk profiles are very different. So make sure you understand what your risk exposure is. And of course, a big part of what we are talking about is what is your risk exposure because of the universe of third parties that you leverage? And we'll talk about a little bit more about that. And then what is your effectiveness of your control? Right, because that, that results in the final consequence value in terms of your ability to avoid something like that. Making sure that those risk types that you're looking at, if you go to the next slide, please that you are thinking far beyond what traditionally sourcing leaders, procurement leaders, and risk leaders have done. It is not enough to just look at the financial health and the cyber health of your third parties. What about the operations health? Where are they operating from? What is the, their resilience plans, right? What, what's happening with the management team? What's happening with their employee base? What about ESG? What is their governance? You know, what, actions might be undertaken because of their of their their ESG posture that they have whether it's environmental social what's the compliance status 
right? Right now we're seeing trade issues, trade wars, we're seeing sanctions, we're seeing regulatory attention, not just in financial banking, but in telecom and others. What is that posture? And then when you start looking at those five that I just talked about, what could be the impact to that third party because of their location of services, but also who else do they depend on the nth party risk? So really expand the aperture of risk domains that you are looking at. So make sure you ask yourself, is my view of risk, when I look at my third parties, truly comprehensive today? Next slide, please. So Victor, let me turn this over to you to kind of go deeper into what constitutes a good location risk coverage. Thanks, Atul. <clears throat> so one of the challenges of managing, and I think this is has a knock-on effect, on how our management boards, uh, why um, uh, leadership teams, management boards sort of throw up their hands and say it can't be managed. It's, it's because the, um, they, they haven't expended sufficient measures to be able to, uh, to, to classify uh, and measure uh, these, these types of risks. And, and I'm, uh, I'm, I've got a, a great deal of sympathy with those that attempt to do this because it's not, it's, it's not easy. This is a very heterogeneous uh, um, sort of, uh, to use the, uh, the risk vernacular op op in operational risk, it's a very heterogeneous loss, uh, represents a very heterogeneous loss, tech, uh, loss uh, history. Uh, and some of these events aren't in your loss history because of course they're quite, um, they're quite novel, they haven't happened before. And so they're, they're very difficult to, to assign an objective probability. Nevertheless, it is necessary to try because um, until you've sort of broken uh, location uh, related risk into its component parts or applied a taxonomy to it, um, like the one you see here, it becomes very, very difficult then to um, use, use that information in the enterprise. So let's go back to our the example uh, about the, um, the household name technology firm. Um, who says, uh, you know, who's the CEO has spoken with the, the gentleman on the farm in Hawaii and compare it to, next slide, please, uh, how the, this um, Swiss reinsurance company uh, has uh, categorized their information needs. So <clears throat> when you look at, um, for example, the information requirements across the enterprise, and you apply that the risk taxonomy on the previous slide, and you start to look at your risk exposures and your probability of events, you start to get a much better, a much more predictive view about what can go wrong, what is my exposure, and if I which controls are effective or ineffective or missing altogether, and then what my what my aggregate risk is. So when you look at what information the corporate security team is looking for, obviously it's around physical security at premises and it's and they're looking at travel security as well and travel security by the way changes uh on a uh, on on an hourly basis during some crises so the um the technology firm model of talking to the oracle once a month it just wasn't, really doesn't work here when you look at op resilience and third party risks you know there's a material impact on supply chains i spoke with a with a uh with a firm this morning a uk based uh, bank this morning who said um, yeah, more than uh, uh, more than half of our costs um, are in the supply chain, and so therefore there's there are some critical functions residing in that supply chain. Without understanding th uh, the risks, uh, both in terms of the risk exposure, but at the impact, there's very little uh, um, there's very little probability of of successfully managing those, or even putting in place um, uh, mitigating. Or, or compensating controls, uh, mitigants, or compensating controls, in, or, in order to be able to uh, to um, to mitigate the, the loss, um, the, the potential losses there. Corporate real estate, um, corporate real estate's looking at this from a number of different perspectives uh, along an, an, an entire life cycle. On entering a certain geography, they're going to be looking at building codes, health and safety laws. Uh, in uh, rental inflation rates uh, about whether that's, uh, you know, even a good, good place, to, uh, a good country in which to do business in the first place. And uh, one that I've run across very frequently in, in the past, uh, local graft and, and corruption risks or threats 
uh, which um, can potentially uh, damage not only reputation, but can get a firm into legal um, issues. Um, in terms of HR and talent, you're looking at the talent pool, wage inflation rates, local labor laws, ESG uh, is looking at sort of um, diversity, equity, and equity inclusion, but as well, you get into sort of natural, natural hazard exposures. What is my natural hazard exposures? Therefore, what measures do I have to have in place in advance? Because after a typhoon occurs, it's, it's, it's a little bit late then to say, oh, well, yeah, we had all of our um, back office finance um, uh, functions were, uh, are, were in Metro Manila. And when the earthquake happened and all of the fiber optic cables were cut off on Christmas Eve and we were in the middle of end of year reconciliations, then yeah, it was, it was a, that was a really bad day. That's an actual, um, an actual case study, by the way. And then lastly, risk uh, in terms of financial risk, assessing country sovereign risk, the, the, the risk of a sovereign default and currency transfer risk. Currency transfer risk is when a, when a country imposes capital controls it's your ability of to, to repatriate um, those, that working capital. So you can't get your, you actually can't get your capital out of the country and you really don't want to put your capital in the country and it can complicate paying suppliers in that country, by the way. So going back to the, to the, uh, the, tech, the household name technology firm, the model of the CEO sort of talking to the Oracle in Hawaii and then coming and trying to sit with all of these leaders um, in some cases, every day or several times a day to assess the risk, it, it just doesn't work. Number one, the Oracle uh, uh, has a point in time risk assessment, and he may have the trends and patterns right, uh, but he, he's certainly not in a position to meet with the business to apply those. And so the information doesn't get to the business, and so the business doesn't uh, apply the risks. And so you, this is why you end up uh, with lack of operational, op operationalization of geopolitical risk and the flyover, uh, the sort of the, the, yeah. the flyover effect. Well, Victor, I think the one of the other key points that you make in this area is how good ongoing location risk information intelligence has applicability across multiple domains, multiple business functions in your company. And I think the next slide now you're going to talk about another case study, which is a specific about what what do you exactly do? So, yeah, sorry. Uh, next slide, please, Victor. So um, this is an example of a, a firm that was managing their, their geopolitical risks extremely well. So um, I spoke with uh, a very senior individual at this firm um, just a few hours uh, after the, six, the 0635 local attack on Saturday, the 7th of October. Um, and he said, hey, look, I've just invoked our global crisis management. Um, we've, just, we've been assessing staff and, and facility safety, um, reached out to staff to see if, uh, if everyone's safe and secure. And uh, the security manager on the site was looking at, um, at if, our, you know, if, if there was any damage to our facility and to do a quick assessment of the, the integrity of our controls. Um, they assessed that they didn't have any staff at danger, nor was any staff families at danger, and they had no staff taken, taken hostage by uh, the Hamas terrorists. So then they looked at, okay, um, it's, it's Saturday. Let's take a look at our aggregate exposure, for both market um, and credit risk, um, including derivatives exposure. So they looked at that. This is, was a bank, by the way. They looked at their market risk exposure and their credit risk exposure. It was within, well within risk appetite. They had adequate hedging in place. Um, so um, that all, all checked out. Um, so then they looked at the, the impacts of the, their, of the, um, of the staff mobiliz of their, sorry, the, the um, mobilization order in Israel. Very soon after the attack, um, Israel mobilized uh, 360,000 reservists. That's um, about 5% of the total population. And when you exclude um, the elderly and the infirm and the young, um, that's a significant age. Uh, there's a snick, an even more significant portion of the sort of the working population. And um, Israel is a very interesting case study for this because of the um, importance of its technology sector and the importance of the firms in that technology sector. Think of it as a mini Silicon Valley, maybe not such a mini Silicon Valley, by the way, <clears throat> But it produces the cybersecurity firms, the anti-money laundering and terrorist finance firms, the 
the application development and maintenance first level one through through four. Um, so when you pull that st- and and the the um, in, in in Israel, the um, the population, the working age population, they have their day job in the technology sector, but they also have their responsibilities in the IDF. And these are the the the, um, the CEOs, uh, the the CEOs, COOs, CTOs of these firms. Um, they're battalion commanders. They're um, brigade intelligence officers. They're very senior people in the in the IDF. So. So um, the immediate requirement uh, after or after assuming after assuring staff safety and facility safety was to find out what the impact was on on the supply chain and uh, because this individual and this firm had the had the had the proper tools and uh, at, at their disposals they knew where the service delivery locations or their of their third parties were they had identified the material nth parties that were supporting those third parties and they were able to immediately within several hours, determine what their exposure was, and then start to reach out to those firms and say, hey, you know, uh, what's what, what's actually going on here, as well as relying on um, alerts from their continuous monitoring solution uh, to be apprised of anything that was in that was in the public domain, which which uh, allowed them to, you know, save time because they didn't have to try to do that manual curation or that curation manually. So, yeah, Victor, um, Victor, I think this is a this is a good case study that shows the proactive nature of risk management practiced here, with the capability to constantly know on an ongoing basis the changes that are occurring, and what actions were being taken. Let's go dig deeper into why you can't just think of this as purely one risk type. And when you look at the next slide, Victor, I think you start talking now more about hey. How else should you be thinking about it? So, um, when you put in place the mechanisms like the firm in the in the in the case study, when you put the mechanisms in place to manage those disruptions on an almost a business with an almost business as usual matter of factness, which is by the way the definition of resilience, then you can focus on the second phase of the crisis because when you look at geopolitical risks. They are by almost by definition um, catastrophic. And the, uh, back from my days of the World Economic Forum, we put some definitions around cat- catastrophic risk, and some of those attributes were that they were rapid onset, often rapid onset, um, and that they they were cascading in their nature. I think um, we are still dealing with the replica- repercussions of COVID, for example, inflation, um, which is a third fourth, maybe even fifth order effect. So rather than have running around with their hair on fire, this firm was like, okay, the immediate uh, actions associated, everybody knows their role, the information gathering, the information is at our disposal. We can manage our risk in a deliberate way. Let's shift our attention to the second order effects and start to do some scenario planning about that because that's where um, we could really experience more, uh, some of our more significant financial losses. And so they looking at supply chain disruptions, humanitarian crisis um, associated with destabilization in the neighboring countries, um, additional geopolitical tensions uh, up into up to and including um, uh, you know kinetic uh, kinetic conflict with, uh, for example, Iran, uh, certainly with Lebanese Hezbollah um, on the border between Lebanon. Um, maybe even dragging uh, Syria uh, into the conflict. There were some strikes on Syria. And of course, some of that you've seen uh, uh, Yemen uh, participating by the prox- the Iranian proxies in Yemen, the, the Houthi rebels. Um, an economic crisis, I, I, I can see uh, this current crisis dragging um, Israel um, into um, fiscal, uh, fiscal distress, certainly. And um, we can't forget cyber attacks, uh, the, state actors, um, non-state actors associated with those proxy actors are going to be very, very active on both sides uh, in this case. So, yeah, sorry, so, uh, I took good. Yeah, so Victor, I think, you know, what, what this kind of reminds me always is that when you look at a single risk type, like in this case, we started talking about geographical risk, you have to think about the second, third, fourth order effects. So in this case, what's starting as a humanitarian crisis with the calling of the reserves starting will start to have an impact on the stability of some of these companies and their ability to be responsive 
So they may not be a third party to you, but they might be a fourth party to you because they're supporting a tech, a tech company or somebody else. And then you start to see other tensions in other areas that impact locations around the world, causes economic issues. And that's when you know bad state actors or non-state actors start taking advantage of that. So let's talk about potential solutions and what risk managers can do very proactively and in the future make this a discipline. The first is you're not gonna be able to get a handle on these events, particularly cascading risks, if you do not monitor events in real time on an ongoing basis. Your assessments do not give you that point of view or that capability. If you're trying to futurize your risk management so that these are not novel risks, these are risks that you've already planned for, you can either mitigate them or in many cases, even avoid them. That you have to have, make sure that you have to have a real time ongoing monitoring capability, at least for your most critical high risk third parties. Victor, um, on the next slide, you know, love for you to kind of jump in and talk a little bit more about, go deeper into TPRM from your experience and what you're talking to risk leaders about today in terms of how should you think about day to day? So Atul, you, you talked about, um, you've talked about the issue of novelty and I, and I think that novelty is a, um, also known as intractability. Um, is it's really key to, to understand how to break that down. And I absolutely love the, um, the, the Basel Committee for Banking Supervision issued uh, a, a paper on, uh, on, op, uh, on um, principles for managing operational risk. And whenever I'm, uh, I'm, uh, uh, I'm faced with sort of an, in, uh, an intractable exposure, I look at it and I say, okay, um, the, the principles for, for that are um, outlined in this, in this document are I need, to, I need to have the mechanisms in place to identify, assess, measure, manage, communicate, and report. And so I benchmark my program, my TPRM program against various risk types using basic scenarios and it doesn't have to be too complicated in fact it could be a, a a verbal whiteboard session where you you take a look and say do i have the ability to identify assess uh measure manage communicate and, and report across all, a number of different um you know geopolitical risk scenarios and if i can assure myself uh, of to do that and to be able to do that in real time then i'm starting to approach really good risk management. By the way, that document is enshrined in most of the third party regulations. And so if you adopt that approach, number one, you're, it is a best practice because, uh, because by virtue of the fact that Basel endorsed it. And number two, you've, you've just, uh, you're able to answer regulators because you're, you're literally speaking, uh, speaking their la language. So next slide, please. When you go back to a more, a little bit more structured, um, dare I say, a little bit more pres prescriptive and disciplined approach for managing risk. Um, it's a very, very different, much more uh, rigorous uh, approach to managing geopolitical risk than sort of our friends back in the household name technology firm, where the CEO talks to the Oracle and they sort of, and then doesn't do anything with the information. Certainly none of the organizations in, um, in that um, reinsurance firms, um, you know, enterprise uh, location risk model, they just don't get the information they need. And so therefore, you're just not in a good per, uh, position to understand and react to what is always going to be a degree of uncertain, no matter how, no matter how good you plan. And so then you are in the uh, domain of show up um, and see what happens, the two-step plan that I talked about a, a second ago. So Atul, um, well, Victor, I think on this up. slide, I think on this slide, um, I want to make sure we are much more specific about what urgent steps people can take. Right? When you think about identify, monitor, respond, right? So think about: Are you clear on who your third parties are? Right? Are you clear what services you get from them? Do you know what locations they provide you that service? And then, who do they depend on? Right. So if you are, if you're using a SaaS software 
they're your third party. And if they're hosting at whether it's Google, AWS, or Azure, that's your fourth party. And before you know it, if you will start to see that in your thousands of third parties, that there are a significant number of fourth parties that show up constantly. So they are almost as critical to you as your third parties. Once you've identified it, how are you actually monitoring them? Because your assessments might be giving you a point of view at one point in time, and hopefully they're comprehensive. They cover, as we talked about, those seven risk domains. They might give you that point of view at a point in time, but what about tomorrow? What when events take place, when change occurs, when risk rises, so much so that there's a potential disruption waiting in the wings? How do you do that? And then of course your plan in terms of how you respond. So hopefully what Victor and I did today is gave you a perspective of why geographic location risk matters. How should one think about it? How should one think about the overall risk model? And then particularly in case of the current conflict, what urgent steps can you take? Now, often the question I get asked, which I'll sh share with you on a couple of slides, so next slide, please, is how can I do this? Is there a service out there? So one of the, our business um, is in the business of providing continuous, ongoing, real-time, full spectrum intelligence. What does that mean? That means for all the seven risk types that you would see in front of you, this is not a one-time assessment. This is ongoing intelligence that's provided to our customers. Some of the largest banks, insurance companies, telecom, high tech, and others are leveraging supply wisdom today to either do less assessments because they have a current view or add this to their assessment so they have a view they always know what the status of their third parties are before the next assessment that might be a year or months later. Also, any kind of alert that they get that they might be able to avoid that risk and or mitigate that risk very quickly, they can see all the cascading risk, they can understand what the trending is and be able to act on that. We're massive users of AI and machine learning, so we're delivering very high accuracy with no noise and one is able to take all this intelligence and actually integrate that within an existing system that they might have, a workflow software that they might have. We aligned with some great advisory companies that support our customers in implementing this change, and in many cases, running this change in a very managed services environment. And then finally, on the next slide, you know, every time there's a major event that happens in the marketplace, one of the things that Supply Wisdom has always done is taken the knowledge that we have, the service that we have, and make that available at no cost to companies. During COVID, we made the alert on global disruptions, location-based disruptions, those alerts available for free, anybody that came to our website and signed on it. And the war in Ukraine, we did the same thing regarding advances, regarding anything, any disruptions, any alerting changes in risk we were seeing between Russia and Ukraine. And today we're doing the same thing around Israel. So if any of you want to be able to monitor what's changing in that environment and do we want to do this on an ongoing basis in real time, please send an email with your corporate email address to info at supplywisdom.com and you should be able to use this service. Victor, any final thoughts or comments before we... Um, uh, so my, my only thought is um, the, the mechanisms, to, uh, the, the, the right frameworks and risk, risk management methodologies um, should be put in place now because they would this events like this will happen in the future. And you just really don't want to be um, in, in, in this, 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 this situation. Uh, where you're 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 you know flying over the flyover states while there's the, your people are in combat on the ground and indifferent to the to to, to the out to the plight of the operations of your firm. Um, yeah. Staff demands more. Investors demand more. Yeah, no, Victor, I think a very good point. So maybe we'll end with that, which is you know the frameworks exist, the solutions exist. So to risk leaders, sourcing leaders, supply chain leaders, take advantage of that so that you can futurize your risk management and ensure that 
you are actually creating a competitive advantage for your company. Why? Because you are ensuring that either that disruption is avoided or that disruption is mitigated very, very quickly. And that's why it provides a lot more stability for your company and for your operations. Um, I encourage people to also follow Supply Wisdom on LinkedIn. Uh, we have incredible risk leaders like Victor Meyer that are part of our company and we're constantly engaging with third-party risk leaders globally. Uh, in fact, one of the groups that uh, I moderate with John Bree called Risk Board. So take a look at riskboard.org where we are constantly engaging with peers, which is third-party risk management leaders and sharing that knowledge through CRO Wisdom, Risk Board, and of course, through our LinkedIn. Thank you everyone. And hopefully stay safe, take care. Thank you, Victor. I appreciate your knowledge. Thanks, Atul.